Welcome everyone, a warm welcome to the second Digital Craft Festival of 2020. We are streaming live from Devon this morning and uh, this is the Devon Guild of Craftsmen and not far away at studio is Arwen Joan, who is Arwen Jones, who's our ceramicist today. If you don't know who I am, I'm Laura Worsley, I'm the interim CEO of the Devon Guild and this is Flora Pearson, our exhibitions manager. And uh, we are based in Bovey on the edge of Dartmoor and we're an education charity representing 280 makers here in the Southwest. And one of our maker members is the fantastic Arwen Jones, who is doing a demonstration today live in the studio in Modbury. Okay, I'll be making one of these. Um, so it'll be a two piece joke. So, first of all, I'll be throwing the bottom part and then the neck. And then after I've done that, I'll be taking the one that I prepared earlier, popping that on, attaching the neck. And there's another one with a neck on it uh, and finished that we ready to put a handle on. And I'll be attaching the handle and pulling the handle. So. Um, hopefully, I should get it all in in an hour. Um, it might overrun a little bit, it depends how we. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and throw a cylinder that's about a foot tall. Um, when I belly it out afterwards, um, it should come to about 10 inches to the top of the. Can you just ask? Hi, Arwen. I um, hope everyone can see Arwen. At the moment, we've got some uh, technical di difficulties here, but hopefully, everyone can still see you. Yeah. You are still there, then, are you? Yes. Yeah, we are. We are. <laughs> Technical glitch for a moment there. Yeah. <laughs> Technical glitch. Right. Only a little one. Uh, okay, I just quickly test the thickness because I don't want to obviously have too thick a base. Um, when you get into the flow of making them, if I'm making a, a little batch of these, you sort of know where you are when you start gauging the thickness of the base. I don't need to usually do that. Make it quite a wide base. Um, as it's quite a tall jug, I don't want it to um, topple over too easily. Right, so now, thumb on the, you can't really see it, but my thumb is uh, around about there on the other side, okay? Gripping here, pushing in with both hands to so the heel of this hand and squeezing between my thumb and fingers and pushing in. Um, when you make a tool form, you need to start with a conical shape and lift. If you start with a flared shape, and try and lift, it just goes further out and it gets harder and harder to do anything. Okay. I don't know whether you've asked, answered this already, Owen, but what clay, are you, what clay is this? Okay, this is a, a clay that I get from Ballantines in Stoke-on-Trent. Right. Um, and it's a, a blend of their PF560 and PF570. So one has got a small amount of Molokite grog in it, and one is very small, uh, is very smooth, has no grog in it at all. Yep. Um, and uh, I get them mixed two thirds smooth and one third grogged, I think, off the top of my head. Might be the other way around, but I don't think so. Um, and if you order a, a big enough amount, they do that for you when they mix the clay up yep. and make the clay. And so that's what I'm using. It's a white stoneware, basically. It's fairly durable, high firing. Yeah, it works well. Okay, so. I find when I get to a certain point, there's no point in trying to struggle and get yourself all twisted up. So I stand up and do the, do the next pause. Okay, and it's all the time I'm keeping it fairly wow. conical. Ideally, that would be another couple of inches taller by now. But hey. What would happen if you did go taller? Talk and, and pot. Yeah, what, Flora's just asked, what would happen if you did go taller? Um, the clay just becomes thinner. Right. And then you find that you can't belly the, the pot out 
because as you belly the pot out, you, you're making the clay walls thinner again. Um, so you have to be, you have to be careful, you know, what shape you're making. So, oh, where are we? There you go. That's set to 12 inches and I've gone a little bit over 12 inches there. That's about right. Um, I know that's roughly right. As I start to belly it out now, it should be, um, um, it'll, the, the height will drop, but it should only drop, what, three or four inches. Okay. So it should be about right. Oh. Oh. Okay, so I try and keep the inside damp. I, I won't, I'll try not to put any more water on the outside. Um, as I'm using a rib to belly out, I'm taking off all of the excess water anyway. But if I don't put moisture on the inside, my finger sticks, and, and then you get a you get a problem with the. Okay. With the Someone, pot. I've got a question, Owen. Yeah. What was, right. what was the weight of the clay that you've used for this? So to begin with, um, this piece is four pounds. I've got a pair, fairly old pair of um, spring scales. <laughs> So uh, they're not particularly accurate, but that's the, 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 the weight that I work from. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, so uh, four pounds for this. I find that these jugs, or the jug shapes that I like and that I make, work on a two thirds to one third. So two thirds for the bottom part of the jug, up to the top of the belly, and then one third for the neck. And that corresponds to the weight of the pieces of clay that I use as well. So it'd be four pounds for the main part of the jug, and then two pounds or just under for the for the collar. Okay, so I'm literally I'm just holding the, the rib against the side of the pot um, and pressing with my left hand on the inside against the rib and just bellying it out really. Um, and it's you just Keep going until you get to a point where you think, oh yeah, that shape looks all right. Um, I tend to leave a, a collar at the top. Helps to keep the pot round, I find. Um, you can go all the way over so as it's, as there's, no, there's no neck, as it were. Um, but I find that, that it tends to make the, the jug less stable when I'm, when I'm stretching it out like this. So I always keep a little bit of a collar there, which I then cut off. Um, in the bottom left hand corner of the screen you'll see that the one that I made ready for the next part and you can see the little collar that I'm referring to there. Okay. And what tool are you using for that, Owen? This is just what we call a rib. This is just a piece of, um, I use a piece of perspex that's been cut. You can get them made out of bamboo, you can get them made out of, of wood or metal normally. Um, the wooden ones I find they tend to have a bit of grain in them. And so every time you run your, your tool over it, you get, you get left with a mark. And the metal ones, um, the, th the ones that are thick enough to, to work with are, are, are liable to rusting. So I tend not to, so I tend not to like using those. And, and I've had this one for, well, probably pushing 20 years now. Wow. And it, you know, it doesn't seem to want to wear out and it's, and it's quite nice. It works well. So, um, and so I stick with them. All of my ribs, I've got three or four, and they are just pieces of perspex. I put them over, put the, uh, a metal tool over them or a wooden tool, whatever shape I would use um, when I decided to change, and then um, just cut around them, and that was that, really. Okay, right. so there I've, we go. I've got one more question from... Yeah, um, keep going, keep going. Fine. Yeah, the question is, what make of wheel are you using today? I'm using a shimpo. Uh, a whisper I think it's called or whatever but it's um it's nice and quiet um I have a my normal throwing wheel is a is a cowley traditional but it's it's quite old and it's very loud um and it's not great for doing demos on because you can't <laughs> you can't hear me let alone um anything else so um yeah uh, so I use this one when I'm doing demos because it's it's you, really quiet you can't yeah, hear it at all can you you can't hear it so I'm just taking the I'm just taking the a little bit of moisture out from the inside. Okay, so that's the that's basically this shape done. Um, I might faff with it a little bit longer if I was if I was doing it for you know if I wasn't doing it as a demonstration. You tend to find that you're under a little bit more of a time scale um, time time limit with this, and you 
you're not really focused in the way that you that you would be if you just sat in your workshop making them. Right, so the other next thing we do is I just put a little mark underneath. So these are finished now. I don't turn these after they're, once they come off the wheel. Okay, so that's basically my the bottom part finished. I might just press in to highlight the, the little ridge at the bottom here, but that'll be, that'll be all. Okay, and because I'm going to be putting this back on the wheel later, I don't wire it off um, and I take the whole bat off. Um, if I'm making the jugs the next size down, say that size, um, I would um, just wet lift those, just wire it off and lift it off the wheel as a, as a piece because it's finished. This I want to keep upright, I want to keep it round uh, and it just makes life easier when it comes to joining. So. Okay, one more question. Um, what, yeah, all right, keep far away. what type of bats do you use? Uh, okay, these are just plywood bats that I've cut. They're not particularly round in terms of you know perfectly symmetrical, uh, but they work and they're quite thin as you can see. Because when you're lifting off a, a pot, you don't really want too much extra weight. Um, and I just throw a slab of clay. Um, that's going to topple off later when I take the other one off. I'll move it over there. Um, I just throw a little disc of clay here, put some grooves in it, wash, stick it down. Um, sometimes, if the I think if it's the second or third time I put a bat onto that slab, I just stamp off the bottom of the bat, pop it on, and then off we go. You're centering the bat first, and then you put the clay. Yeah, I mean, you don't, I don't have to centre the bat, but it's a bit distracting when you've got a, a bat that's not quite in the centre, and you, you end up with a, what we call a potter's nod. So... <laughs> Just right, so making the net now, so two pounds of clay roughly. Um, when it's a small piece of clay like that, I tend not to bother re-wedging it again. Um, that's just cut at two pounds from the mark and off we go. Okay. Um, Seth, uh, sorry, um, we just need clarification on what your wheel's called. Uh, a shimpo whisper. A what, sorry? Shimpo. S-H-I-M-P-O. Okay, a shimpo whisper. Sorry, someone thought you said shampoo. Oh, well. <laughs> a shampoo. I prefer, I prefer it that way of a shampoo whisper. Right. Sounds fantastic. We've got a link right. to them in the chat now. Oh, okay, fabulous. Right, so we have um, that one was thrown. Okay, and it's roughly ten inches from the base to the to this point here. Um, so therefore. Divide that by two gives you the next third. So the next piece needs to be five inches. Okay, oh, five inches measured. So I'll, I've got a rough idea. It doesn't have to be exact because I will trim it. Um, I also measure the width at the top. Um, I made a few earlier, so I've got my gauge set up. So the width of the opening, because I throw it upside down, needs to be that wide. Then it will fit on the neck of the jug or the base part. Does that make sense? Have I been clear? Yeah. Clear as mud, they say. Clear as mud. So I go right to the bottom and then pressing down, I move my fingers underneath to spread the clay. Okay, so it's now, I don't know if you can see it now, but I've gone right to the back. There's no, there's no base to that. Okay, and then it's very similar to how I started the other half. So I push in, lift up, and I want the neck to have a slight flare. You can see on the one over my shoulder here, it sort of does that. But I don't want it to do that exactly that straight away. I want it to be slightly straighter because it's easier to then push it out than it is to push it back in again if it's gone too far. Um, that's the one I want. So there you go, virtually five there. And it needs to be a little bit wider. So. Again, I just smooth it out. Again, if I'm doing, if I do, because I do it like this, what it allows me to do is it allows me to keep a bit of weight and thickness of clay at the top, which will be the this part of the jug. And by in so doing, it, it means it stops the pot becoming mean, and it allows me to adjust it slightly, flare it out without the without that part becoming thin and too flimsy. Okay. 
Um, and as it's quite a large jug, it needs to, again, those sorts of things need to, need to match. Um, There's no point in having a really big pot that's wafer thin and the first time you use it, you can, you can too easily chipped or damaged it. Um, when you come up with a design, Arwen, and it, is that something that you do? Do you kind of, once it's all fired, and do you take it into the kitchen and use it and, you know, kind of, you know, test it in a way? Uh, yes, in, in general. I, I mean, all of my pieces will be, you know, I, I've got various um, incarnations of pots that I've made over the years, and they all inform, um, you know, the, the, the pieces going forward. Um, which is, you know, for me, I think is quite important. Yeah. Um, but they're not, how can I say, they don't, it's not like all of a sudden I have a new design. They evolve. Um, and you, I always say, I put, I put the pots, as you can see behind me, there's, there's pots there. And while they're drying, you're sort of looking at them from all sorts of different angles as you walk around the workshop and you, you just sort of live with them and you see the things that you think, oh, I really like that quality or, or from that angle, I'm, there's something not quite right about it. What is it? And you, yeah. you live with it and you think on it and you, over time, that informs how you move forward or how the form move forward, moves forward. Um, and sometimes it can be a big change, but it, it isn't, in my mind, it isn't a big change uh, because I've been thinking about it for so long. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but also because I do, I do quite a lot of, of um, wholesaling uh, and selling to shops and, and galleries and what have you. Um, the last thing they want is is um, forms to be changing all the time. So I like to try and get things that are fairly similar. And if they do change, it is only subtle. Yeah. Um, it allows them to you know people to keep coming back and thinking, oh, I bought one of those. I want another one. And it's like yeah. that. Or yeah, you know, greater or lesser extent. <laughs> Okay, so I'm doing quite well time-wise, so I'm, I'm having a bit of a waffle. No, no, no. Come on, can I ask another question? Yeah, just, just keep <laughs> away. You've kind of answered it a little bit, but maybe it's that kind of where do you start and your inspiration as well. But what is your design process when designing, um, um, you know, a new range or new items? I tend not, that, that's, that's something I, I tend not to do. I don't tend to design a new range. Um, <laughs> I say it's more evolutionary than that. Um, but... Food, basically, everything I make is functional and I want people to use them in the kitchen or on the table. Um, and so therefore that tends to drive the, the thought process. Um, uh, that's a simple answer really. I tie into that, the trad pottery traditions from all over the world. Um, and then you get this sort of hybrid thought process and, and realization of an idea. Um, that's the easiest way to describe it, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but function, I suppose, uh, first and foremost. Um, yeah. I want the pot to, it to be obvious what the pot will do or should be doing, and also then does that job yeah. well. Um, I don't want it, you know, it's not about, oh, I want it to be a, a bowl, but um, it doesn't really work well, but I like how it looks. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I find that hard, a difficult way to work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so I've just, I've just taken the excess clay off the bottom of this. Um, and I'm just putting a small groove underneath so that when I come to wire it off, I've got somewhere for the wire to, to travel easily and it won't move away from the, um, from the back. Because when I turn it, when I wire it off, it's going to be upside down. So I won't be able to really hold it in place. It'll, it'll be, it's a little bit trickier. Okay. Again, I don't wire this off until I want to... Um, actually you know take it off take the bat off once it's joined to the to the base of the pot okay so we've got a nice comment here oh, have we, okay um, i've got some i've got a lovely comment and then we've got a good some good questions coming okay, through okay far away <laughs> Kathy Ward says that she bought her husband one of your mugs at the bubby show a few years ago and it's his favorite mug and he uses it daily oh, that goes back to thank you very much and I, i'll do a quick plug so this is my bit of paper for everyone. So you can buy Arwin products at his website, arwinjonesceramics.co.uk. And also the Devon Guild of Crossmen is a, uh, a stockist and will be open next Wednesday. Nice <laughs> plug of the hour, sorry. I won't do too many. <laughs> okay, right. So, uh, one, those are the two pieces thrown. Um, oh. <laughs> let me just put them back up here briefly. So you've got that one and... Wow. 
that one. Okay, so you can see, obviously, I'm not going to flip it over now because I've only got one hand to do it, but one will go, this one will be inverted. I'll cut the collar off and put the two on, which is what I'm about to do with one that I threw yesterday. This is your okay. blue Peter but, moment. Absolutely. So we have, um, ta -da. okay. Um, now, I, you can, I will be using a, tor a blowtorch in a minute just to stiffen it off properly because what I'd like to do is I like to leave them 24 hours normally, it just depends on the weather really and, the, and whether I've had kilns firing or what have you. But about 24 hours, the whole base stiffens up, um, but it's still quite soft. So once I cut the rim off, cut this little bit of neck off, um, I then use the blowtorch just to properly stiffen up this, this rim. Because when I put the next piece on, I don't want it to sink. I don't want it to be you know, too much. Okay, and that's part of the reason I could make these jugs in, in one piece. It's only six pounds of clay, it's not impossible. But I find I get a, I get a, a shape that I'm more happier with. I get a, a pop that at the end of the day, I'm, I like the look of more than I do if I make them in a single piece. The weight feels more evenly distributed. Um, maybe I'm, I'm just not a good enough thrower to be able to throw it to the quality that I want in one piece. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's basically why I, why I do it like this. Um, and these pieces, I mean, this is the smallest version of this that I will do. Um, so the next size will be anything from five pounds and two and a half, six and three, depending on, you know, whatever I'm, a, I'm feeling like doing or, or whether I have an order or commission for, for a jug of a certain size or, or a vase of a certain size. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the thought process behind it. So I need to centre this up first, so a little... A little pause while I centre this. Oh, it's suddenly gone dark outside. Sun's gone in. Cold, fresh morning down here in Devon, and it's. It is a cold, fresh morning. I oh, know. Hence the uh, hence that we're in woolly. <laughs> <here. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Grade two listed mill. It's quite chilly this morning. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much in the middle. Let's give it a little press down. Okay, so now. Just get my knife. You make this really easy, Owen. I did um, did a, a ten week beginners pot throwing course, right. and it, it's just so pot throwing to me is so difficult. It is so difficult. It's like everything. It's amazing it's that practice, you can do practice, practice. You know, yeah. I couldn't. You know, you, you can't. Ex I mean, I've been doing it for what? I graduated in ninety five, um, and I've never really stopped making pots since then. So, you know, it is, a, it is a lifetime of doing things. Um, and I look at the pots I made back then and I cringe. Um, and, and hopefully if I'm still going in another 20 years, I'll look at the pots I'm making now and cringe again. So, you know, it, it, we're always learning. We're always trying to get better. Uh, we're not yeah. hopefully never standing still, uh, yeah. whether it be technically or, or, or visually or you know, however you, you look at it. So... So what, a couple of questions. So um, how did you train and did you go to art school? Did I go to art school? Yes, I did. Um, simple answer. Um, um, so I did uh, fairly traditional art training. I went to, uh, I did a foundation course um, at Banbury College of Art and Design. I, grew, I was living um, in Oxford at the time or just outside Oxford at the time. Um, and so I did a, a foundation course in, in Banbury, Oxfordshire, um, and then I went and worked, and then I went and did a, a degree in three-dimensional design, ceramics, um, at Loughborough College of Art and Design. It was a, an independent college, um, and back in those days, um, I've, been, I've been listening to Sarah talking about those sort of days in the late 80s, early 90s. They were really quite high days for, for art education and I did a three year course just making pots. Um, I don't think there are many if any courses that are just three years of making pots now. They tend to be modular or, or it's part of another course um, and as a result I, you know, I knew from an early, early start that I wanted to make functional pots. I wanted to make thrown functional pots um, and I was able to to have a go at doing that um, and, and to, to hone the skills and learn those skills on that degree course. Uh, it would be great. Yeah. Can't, 
Can't speak highly enough of it, really. It's fantastic. Right, I've cut that off. Um, as you can see, I just tidied it up a little bit. Um, the neck ugh, is here. So I want the neck to be softer than I do the base to begin with. Not a lot softer, but softer. Um, because I still need to throw this a little bit, okay? But in a moment, once I've dried it off, I'll be sticking that on top of there, and you get an idea now of what the jug will sort of look like, okay? So, first things first. Now that I've cut this off and put a bit of water on there to tidy it up, this is actually really quite soft. I don't know if you can see that giving. It's really quite yeah. soft. Now. So, oh, that was what fell over. My matches. Apologies. Right, okay, so the fun bit. Wow. All potters and closet or out there, pyromaniacs. <laughs> um, no, I'm no different. So, all right, let's hope I don't blow myself up. Oh, there we are. All right. This is live, Owen. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll put those out of the way. <laughs> This is an old, old plumber's torch that my father had that's been, it's probably older than I am, this is, um, but yeah. <laughs> so, really safe. Just literally just keep going doing this, this might take a, a few moments. Okay, so I've, I've got one more question. Uh, what are your go-to tools when making and throwing as you've got a... Okay, a right, so yeah, I have um, a rib, so one of those, basically, um, and also, I get through these like you wouldn't believe, um, just a, a little triangle tool which I use for undercutting each time, so I always make that little ridge. Um, yeah, even though they're stainless steel and it's only rubbing against wood, I probably get through one of those every three years. It just wow. goes down yeah. one side. So yeah, those are the, probably the two things that I, that I'd struggle without, I suppose. Um, uh, these, of course. <laughs> <laughs> most important tools. The most important. Yeah, um, I use um, I use a few knives when I'm making my um, the non-round pieces, shall we say? And they tend to be bits of um, uh, metal strapping that are used to, um, to 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 keep pallets of bricks together. If you go and see see them on building sites, they tend to be bits of plastic strip now, but you can still get wire but um metal bands instead of plastic and if you if i come across those i tend to tend to grab them and put them to one side because they're they're quite rare but they're they're really good they're quite thin um they're usually quite straight as well and i cut them into make them into hoops to make turning tools or i'll or just cut them into lengths to make um uh, knives to cut pieces of clay they're quite thin so there's very little resistance when you're going through a a leather hard to soft piece of clay that works quite well um, um, and I have a, an old car aerial an old a remote control aerial that I use when I'm making batches to, um, to as my gauge I just stick it on a blob of clay on the edge of my on the shelf in front of my wheel um, once I've thrown the first one I just adjust it to that that again I could probably use a stick but I found a little old an old radio controlled um, yeah, antenna from a from a, from a kid's toy was really useful. Um, it's starting to stiffen up quite nicely. Yeah, I'm just going to give the base a bit of a whiz over. I threw three pots yesterday to, to, to this demo, and the first two were okay, but I wasn't 100% happy with them. Then I had to go off and get the kids from school. So I, uh, I, I decided I'd throw another one. So I threw this one last night, uh, and consequently it's not quite as stiff as I would want it to be. Um, but hey, I knew it happened. I had fun with the torch, so. Yeah, how long, uh, how long did that take you? Because remember that you probably, you know, you weren't on a Zoom, a Zoom uh, demo last night. Uh, uh, probably about, um, let me just check that first. Probably about, what, 10 minutes to wedge and throw the, the base and a couple of minutes, if that, to throw the collars. The collars are much quicker and easier, but it's the bases you tend to fuss over a little bit more to try and get a nice curve. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, I don't, I don't turn them again afterwards. So the time that I might have spent finish them with a, finishing them with a tool later, I 
put into making the pot that little bit more finished um, uh, before I take it off the wheel when I'm throwing it. Okay, right. Now, it's quite warm this year and it has dried off quite a lot, um, but I need it to hold the weight, but it's not, it hasn't changed color, it hasn't gone white yet. So uh, that's the, you've got to get it to a, a, a drier leather rather than a softer leather. It's that to those people who, who, who are more familiar with playing with clay. Um, and then, although this is softer, I'm going to be adding a bit more water to it when I throw it, just a, you know, just a little bit. And so extra will go on this and it will soften it back up a little bit. So I don't, I'm not that worried. And then I'll leave it for 24 hours again once it's finished, covered up to even up again before I then add the handle. Um, so you might think, oh, you're, you're, you're joining a soft piece of clay and a, and, a, and, a, and a harder piece of clay, you're going to get a crack. Um, sometimes you can, but you find that the more you do it, the more you intuitively know when something is okay to do. Mm. Okay, that's about right there. So, Just a quick question, do you varnish your plywood bats, Owen? No, no, not at all. So um, I, use a, I either use marine ply, or exterior ply, simply because they use, um, well, the, the, marine, the marine ply are of superior quality above all, and the, the thickness of the ply is quite generous for the top or bottom layer. Um, and, the, and the exterior ply, um, although that it's like a very thin veneer that they put for the last piece, and that can wear out over time, but they use um, solvent-based glues to, um, to make them, to when they make the ply. And so they, when you're adding, sitting in with water, it doesn't dissolve the glue. It doesn't, over time, make the glue and it, well, stop sticking, basically. Um, so that's why I, I use those. You can use thicker bats, uh, but I, I like to use a thin bat just because it makes life that little bit easier. Um, as I, you know, I don't want to be carrying <laughs> half, a, half, a, half a hundred weight of, of wood when I don't need to, basically. <laughs> okay, right, so... What I did then is I got it in the middle and I just put a, a little line, I don't know if that's in, in any way visible, um, but I just scored a very thin line um, so as I know the outside edge of that, this, of that, of that collar. And then I just literally just follow that. And you can see how, how it's dried off by the fact that some of those bits of clay are, are, are tumbling off the side of the pot. Okay, so I just score that now. Right, um, and then we do the same on this one, and you can see we able to see the difference. Um, yeah, you can see that. Um, it's much softer, and I've also put, as you can see, this this isn't flat. Top of this is at a slight angle, so this is also at a slight angle. Right. Um, this, this edge here, so that it will sit more cleanly uh, and easily, and I should get a better join straight away. Okay. So, um, and for those of you, who, who, this is the end of the saw blade, um, so just to just to cut it off with a pair of tin snips, and it's it's wonderful for scoring and what have you. It just makes life so much easier, and it's it's quite a deep tooth oh, um, saw blade. Uh, is that clearer? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and, and it's brilliant. I use it for just about everything. Okay, so I just pop that into the into my water tray there. You can see it's now nice coating of water on there. And then I don't bother with this bit because the, the amount of moisture in the top bit will do the job there. And I literally pop it on where I'm trying to follow that line as best I can. Okay. Do you, do you ever use pit firing or raku is a question that's just come in, Norrie. Uh, when I was at college, I, I did some raku firing. I've never done a, a pit firing, um, but I did raku as part of my course. Um, uh, but I, and while I enjoyed it, I love the process. It's fantastic playing with fire and lots of smoke and you get really dirty and it's great um the pieces at the end of the day I, they're not they're not functional in the in the way that i want a pot to be functional and so that's why i didn't continue doing that and haven't done any since um 
but yeah, I, I enjoyed the process. Uh, it was it was fantastic, uh, great fun. As that as the person who asked that question, do they make with raccoon? Have they made with raccoon? Oh yeah, let's yeah let's hit, please comment in the uh, chat. That's low. Right, so I've just pushed that on gently. Okay, and now take the wire, pop it underneath the bat. Lift the fly, same amount of pressure back, and it pops through. Okay. And that's just fishing line, by the way, just thin gauge fishing line. That's all I use. And these are the ties from the clay bags. You just wrap them around, tie a knot each end, simple. Okay. Um, okay. And then well, how thick is the clay at the minute then? How thick? Thin. Thick. Okay. So I'm going to put that up, that up here. So, right, so that's the thickness of the clay at the neck that's probably out of focus there you go um yeah. okay that i've just taken off and i don't know if you can see can you see on the top this is um probably this top section here is probably twice as thick as that here but it will be a similar thickness maybe slightly thicker where i've just joined it okay um right and that is now pretty close to being spot on on the inside and okay and now I can just tilt my jug a little bit because it's soft I can just I don't have to recenter it as such I just give it a little twist because it's the top that I want in the middle don't really worry about this bit okay a little bit of water now around here putting my hand underneath that ridge with the water again on that jug on that in, on that sponge underneath so my fingers flow easily um, okay you can see that it's probably wobbling a little bit you think oh but it's not in the center <laughs> once it's once it's off the wheel it's never going to get spun around again so that slight wobble will never be noticed it took me a long time to get my head around that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, but I've got to make it round. It's got to be perfect. <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be perfect. Because it doesn't look out around now, does it, when it's not spinning around? So. Yeah. All right, it's just a little tip for those fuss asses out there like me. We've got, okay. um, what glazes do you use? I know it's a bit of an early question because you'll probably talk about that at the end, but. What days? Uh, I, I, um, yeah, I, I was quite lucky. I, as I say, I, I wanted to. I knew when I was at college that I wanted to make functional pots, um, and I knew, yeah, I was quite focused on that. I knew where I was. I decided at an earlier point what I what I wanted to make, and so I used that time to at college to make glazes that worked and did the job that I wanted them to do, on a style of pot that was. You know, again that I wanted to make okay um, so I, I, I spent pretty much all of my second year making tests by the plenty um, and I hit upon the greeny blue glaze that you can see here um, it's changed ever so slightly as materials change and as different kilns fire in a different way heat work and all the rest of it but it's basically the same same recipe um, uh, and I was very fortunate that that glaze people liked it's pretty timeless um, and then over over the over the years I've added the blue the pale blue there's a white glaze as well so it's a very simple palette um, but I didn't it's not about the glazes are hopefully going to um, accentuate the form and the marks that I put on the pieces so I don't decorate they're just dipped um, mm. so it was always going to be very simple um, very simple glazes that allowed the, the form to stand out and also whatever the piece was being used for um, to, to, to be at the forefront as opposed to any form of decoration. Um, does that kind of answer it? They're, they're high-fired stoneware glazes, so these ones are oxidised, they're Cone 9 um, and um, mm, yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, this one is a this one is also the copper red. It's a Derek M's glaze that I altered slightly to work better with my clay and 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 what have you. Um, but it's basically a Derek M's glaze. That one's one that I 
played with in the film when I was playing with clay, playing with glazes rather when I was at college, as I said. So, right, I need to, I need to keep going. Where are we time-wise? 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah okay. 20 minutes, sorry. And then uh, just, just quickly last another question on top of the yeah. game is, how do you know if they're food safe? Because you talk about, you know, that all your um, work is functional, it's for the kitchen. So how do you know your glaze is food safe? Right. Well, you tend to find that, that it's, A, it's lower fire pots. So, you know, earthenware pots, not, there's anything wrong with earthenware pots, but they can use lead as a, the main flux. And obviously lead has, can have effects if you're using it with certain um, colouring oxides. So it tends to be more lower fire pieces that are, that, that that's more of a concern with. Um, there's, you know, I don't use uh, poisons per se. <laughs> um, and that's basically it. Um, it. It's to do with the firing temperature and the fluxes that I use. Um, uh, yeah. Does that answer that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I'm just trying to. You mentioned glazes made by Derek, someone? Could you just. Derek Ends. E double M S. Okay. A fantastic potter, amazing glaze technician himself, and, um, um, and he was wonderfully generous. He published his glazes as well, which is why I was able to basically take that glaze and, and alter it slightly um, for me because it was it, it was out there. Okay, so that was five inches. It's now a bit taller. Jug looks a bit tall, so I'm going to cut that top bit off, and you'll then get an idea of the thickness of the clay at that point. Okay, so there you go. All right, and I'm going to thin that a little bit more now. Okay. So, there we go. If you buy any, any glaze book, you know, from wherever you buy your ceramics books from, pottery books from, um, you'll find um, that there will be a reference to him or perhaps a glaze of his that's been being used. Um, so he was one very generous and an amazing potter in his own right. Okay, so that's that. So I'm just wetting again now the top third to make my rim. Oh, throw that out. Okay, so I like to put a little ridge here. Um, and what that does is it, a, it gives me a, it adds like almost like a, the beginning of a, the end of a sentence is almost like a full stop. Um, but it also gives me the, a place where I start my handles from. So they come off of this little ridge. No. Right. Okay. Oh, and how, how do you balance your time with making and kind of doing all the admin that goes with being a maker? How do I balance it? Very badly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should be a, I, I'm, I'm definitely not really a, um, we do those things because we have to, um, I'm not a particularly efficient bookkeeper or, or, or business person on that side of things, to me it's about making the pots, um, but I've got to do those other things otherwise I can't make a living, so yeah, um, I tend to wait until the deadline or, or, or the, or I need some money paying to me is really quite pressing and I'll write the invoice and send it out to somebody and say, these pots I sent you, um, however many weeks ago. <laughs> um, but I'm very lucky that people, you know, I like to have a relationship with the people who I, <laughs> who I, who sell my work and we tend to find that it gets on, we get on quite well and it works. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, very badly. Um, but. Yeah, <laughs> and my accountant will vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there you have Jug joined, Bosch, ready to go. Uh, oh no, 
it won't be a joke, it's a vase at the moment, I need to pull the handle. So I'm going to try and pull this around here so that people can see. How many days uh, roughly are you making? How many, how many days? Oh, every day. Every day. Yeah. Um, so dry hand against the soft clay and then a wet finger to hold either side, push to the dry fingers and just pull as your, your wet finger just slides over the clay and just gradually ease it forwards um, in there, like that. Okay, and I just slide my fingers up there. So you can see that we have a, the beginnings of the spout. Okay, again, I'm, I believe that if elements of a piece suggest their function, chances are they're gonna perform that function pretty well. Uh, so I believe if the spout says, I pour, and you look at it and think, oh, that's suggesting its function, it'll, chances are it'll pour quite well. If a handle says, oh, pick me up, it looks like it's gonna feel good, it will. Okay, so then um, I'm gonna do this this side because this is how I normally do it and then I'll turn it around and do it again to show you. So I squeeze either side of that curve and then just lift and pull. Okay, and as you can see that lifted up, so you get this sort of, and again, it just helps create that, oh, I pull. And so what I did there was I squeezed here and lifted. Okay, but my thumbs are on the outside. All right, okay. And then I just literally pull it back a little bit more, just tidy it up, and that's it. I don't extend the clay there, I just don't. Um, I'm not the quickest to maker, so I, anything I can do that will make life a little bit. Okay, so, so that's that one. Someone's not far, when do you get backache? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, you've probably seen, I'm sit, I sit like this a lot when I'm working, and I, yeah, so I've got shoulder and neck, Curve, yeah. Don't go there. Don't become a potter forever. It's, it's not <laughs> <your help. laughs> okay, so now, why that one? Oh, why that one off? I'm going to have to remember to. You forget to do things when you're talking, so I haven't just there's a small amount of water that's gone in there. I just need to. That's it. Tidy that up. Okay, so because it's gone round, it resticks itself. So let's just wire that one off. Okay. Look at that bosh, jug. You love that. Look at that. Okay. Amazing. Right. And now, as I say, I will, once this is, once I've finished, I'll take that to one side and I'll wrap it up and I'll turn it around the other way so you can see the spout a bit more. There. There you go. Right, so that'll get wrapped up now. 24 hours at least. Maybe tomorrow afternoon um, I'll, I'll put a handle on that. Okay. Right. So... Get down, Chef. No, sorry, she's in the My blue Peter. Right, okay, so here's the one I did yesterday. Yay! Um, okay, so what I need to do now is put a handle on it. Where have I put my handles? Down here. So, just out of shot here is a, an extruding machine um, from Gladstone Engineering, Stoke on Trent standard piece of kit, nothing special. Um, and you get these uh, aluminium dies that go in the bottom and you basically they're solid and you cut out whatever shape you want. So I pull my handles, but I don't, how can I put it? I don't, um, I don't start them with the pull and then cut them off. I basically cut out a shape that's bigger than the handle I want and then I cut that to the right length, attach it to the pot, and then pull it. Again, it speeds it up, but it also gives me greater uniformity in the handles that I make. So they're all the same length, they're all the same cross-section in the first place and size. It just makes life a little bit quicker again, and a bit and, and easier. Um, right, so in here is, he says, can you find it? Yeah, there it is, right. Get that one out of the way. Extrusion. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, before I started the demo, I measured the distance from here to here, just in a straight line. It was about five inches. So I thought, okay, so if I add a couple of inches, that'll give me enough length of handle to play with. Bear in mind, if you look at this one, it needs to be a good 
good size, you can get your hand in there, but it's a big jug, so it needs to be quite wide. So it's going to fit the pot. There's no point in putting a skinny little handle on a big jug because it doesn't say, pick me up. It says, oh, I better be careful with that. I love the way that you say the pots speak. It's good. <laughs> they do. They send yeah, messages. I love it. Like, you know, <laughs> like but anyway, so that's not quite wide enough. So if I put that on there, it, it, it needs a bit of clay to join it properly. So I tap in the middle like that and I spread that end all the way around okay to create a wide flat join now, this will be quite fun because i normally pull handles standing up <laughs> and obviously if i stand up you're not gonna be able to see what i'm doing so um we'll, we'll have fun hopefully okay so now i've made that flat okay i then this is where the fun starts i then uh, wet my thumb and just rub it opposite the spout obviously and either side of that ridge uh, okay so you can see that it's just what I don't score it um, or what have you I just keep adding a bit of water to my thumb when it starts to stick against the pot and I just rub it around and around and around until it builds up its own slurry basically and I'm creating the slurry effect that you get from carving or scoring and then adding a little bit of slip okay and that's all i do there so you can see now see that area okay and then i take the handle try and line it up as best i can pop it on there and then press against the pot okay i try and if I was standing up, you see, I'd be able to I'd look over it more easily, but you tend to look that way. Yeah, that's about right. Um, bear in mind that the pot will unwind slightly. So there's, you need to slightly offset your handle so that it, when it finishes, it's wound straight, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, so it's ever so slightly to the left of the, as I'm looking at it, and then it will wind round to be straight when, I, when I've, um, at the bottom when I've finished it. Okay. Okay, so I, I now attach underneath. I'll move this round. How are we doing for time? Five minutes. It should be about right. Um, do, I've got another question. Does, yeah. does a particular style or history of pot making from an area of the country inspire you? That's a good question. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so. I wouldn't say any one place, okay? So uh, this is going to be tricky for me to answer this and do, answer that and do this because I'm <laughs> tell you. Thanks to whoever asked that one. Um, yeah, so I tend to find that country pottery in general from all over the world um, inspires me, informs me, shall we say. Um, and then going from there, glazes from, from the Far East basically, be they Japanese, Chinese, Korean, again, inform how I like to try and finish my pieces. And it's, that's, where we, that's where I come from. But you tend to find that the country pottery was made for use. Mm. There was nothing overly elaborate or fancy about it. It was just pots for everyday use by everyday people. And I really quite like that. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, where I, that's where they would come from. We, be it... English slipware, North Devon slipware, mm. Spain, Portugal, French, German, you know, China, Japan, straightforward, honest pots just made for that use and that use alone. Okay, right, so handle attached. Okay, I'm going to try not to lift it up too high. <laughs> I then wet my hand and get the, get the clay wet and I slowly but surely start stretching that okay and I it's important to keep the jug up at eye level okay or whatever it is you're pulling don't try to pull your handle down here because you can't really see what the handle's doing but also you find that you tend to do this with your hand whereas if it's up there it's easier to keep it straight which in turn keeps your handle straight okay so 
the jug's out of shot, but it's, it, I think it's more important to see the handle. I've tried to, <laughs> you try to do it quite quickly because, you know, it's still six pounds of clay that I've got hung up in front of me. And I want to get, I don't want to get my arm too tired. <laughs> so there has to be an element of urgency to it. Okay. So as you see, I've tried to get that to come slightly forward, but not too forward. So, you know, just off the, just off the, vertical okay and i've just run my finger down it and created a little ridge in the center so by running my thumb either side and leaving a space in the middle i get a little ridge and that i do that deliberately because my glaze is like um those higher points on the pot the glaze pulls away from those and you get a nice change of color and and what have you and a point of interest okay so that's uh, fairly straight okay and then just move my hand back a little bit this is the, always the fun bit and then try and get it in there so i try to go just below there we are really straight pretty much try to go just below that widest point okay so the widest point of the jug Okay, and then pinch that bit off. So it's always good to be generous. As you notice, I didn't put any slip or score where I joined it there. So I just run a little bit of water behind, just a drip off my finger. And then using my thumb, I just press it down. And this is where having the jug at, at the right stage is important. Because if you press too hard like this, when the when the jug is soft, all that happens is that just presses in, and you don't get the don't get the join. Okay. Okay. So I've made that sort of a shape. Okay. I then take that bit off, and I start to create um, a simple curve, and it's basically in sport inspired by the Gothic arches, basically. So it's an inverted Gothic arch. And that's what I try to, how I try to finish off the, the bottoms of my handles. And it is as simple as that. So you then have that simple finish and you can see it's slightly off to the left and that should unwind just enough to make it straight. Okay. I would finish that by putting my stamp here and that would be me done. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, I like to find that um, the handles can, can grow from the pot as opposed to looking like they've been stuck on. That's quite important for me. Um, and I, like the, I don't like it to be too big a join um, or obvious join where, you, where the, handle, the beginning of the handle meets the, the neck of the jug. So I, as you can see, I just push in there and create a little ridge and underneath push up again and it creates the impression that it's a much narrower join than it actually is um, and again it, visually it, it works quite nicely um, and I would just try and create a little bit more tension in that handle um, if I was being uber fussy but it's not too bad that side doesn't look so good that side looks no. okay okay um, oh. quick question Owen how it's do you right. know which way the handle will move okay so <laughs> it's, it's to do with the way your wheel spins round. So my wheel spins uh, anti-clockwise. Yeah, anti-clockwise. Um, and so when I put my handle on, um, I, if I'm looking at it, it pulls ever so slightly to my left. I'm left-handed as well, so that makes it easier for me to, oh yeah, slightly to the left rather than slightly to the right. Uh, but it's only fractionally, it's not a lot. You know, and you'll find if you put a handle on straight, it, it might move slightly, especially if you've got it on a, a jug, for example, it, um, it's more obvious. Um, not necessarily so obvious on a, on a mug. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I'm looking at it here. Um, where are we there? So my handle is ever so slightly this side. Ever so slightly. You know, yeah. five mil is that. Uh, but that's just because I know that that's how it's going to work best. Mm. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to keep, uh, please ask questions if you want to ask questions. I'm, I'm happy to, <laughs> I'm happy to, it's happy to chat, it's fine. It's, you know. you're, you're just getting lots of amazing comments saying great demo and thank you and really inspiring. So that's cool. what well, I'm, glad it, I'm glad it was, a, you know, that it worked. I was a little bit nervous, to be honest. You know, we all get nervous yeah. doing these things. So I'll yeah. do a quick plug as well. We can buy all Arwin products at Arwin's website. And here we open next Wednesday. It's my second plug. <laughs> um, we we just stuff. wanted some um, recommendations of, oh, for um, wheels and kilns and good oh. suppliers to get them from. The oh. starting out. <laughs> I don't. I, I say beforehand that I don't. I, I, I'm not sponsored by anybody, so I, it, it's, it's just personal preference. You find something that works for you, or somebody's piece of equipment that works for you. And go with it. I've, for, for whatever reason, I bought a Cowley tr traditional wheel. Um, it, it is a big wheel and it works well and it's a good workhorse. That's what I use mainly. Um, the Shimpo is fantastic. They are, they are known as the Rolls Royce of wheels. Um, I can show, I can throw a huge amount of clay in one go on this. Um, so it's great for all sorts. But it's also light and transportable, so I can take it to events easily. Um, but it's just not, I don't want to sit at this wheel all day, every day. It's just, light isn't right. Whereas the Cowley, it's got a, more of a, I'm a little bit more upright and the pots are more here. So I'm not quite so astute. Just, that's just. How is spelling Cowley, Owen? Sorry. As in Oxford, as in Oxford Cowley. So C-O-W-L-E-Y. That's great. Um, and um, what else? Uh, kilns. Again. <laughs> You know, I started with Stanton, um, the great kiln manufacturer. They, they were bought out by somebody else. I don't know who makes Stanton kilns now. Um, they're great. I have um, Northern Kilns kilns at the moment. Fantastic engineers, great people to work with. Um, so, yeah, I would recommend them. Clay, yeah, I mean, I started off with pot clays clay, and I've just, my, my, as my work has evolved, so has the kind of clay that I want and the, my knowledge of clay has grown and now I use Valentine's. Um, I must admit that was also a, you know, a price thing. I could get a slightly cheaper product mm. that was really good and what I wanted and they're wonderful people to work with um, um, in the, you know, give Valentine's a ring and they'll do their best. I'll bend over backwards for you. Um, and again, that's not me plugging Valentine's. It's just my experience of them. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, there you go. Oh, and I suppose kiln shelves. I mean, I get those from Stoke on Trent from Walter Brayford, and again, he will bend over backwards for you. Uh, Acme bats, A C M E bats, um, and he will he'll cut for you. He'll do whatever sizes. He's got thousands and thousands of bats in stock, uh, and he, you know, he he is the he is the go-to man for that. So yeah, right. Uh, and CTM supplies, those are the other people I use for glazed materials. So, yeah, again, because it's just they're right down the road for me, so I can just drive in and get what I want when I want it. Um, and, yeah, and they're very reasonable, very competitive prices. So there you go. Um, and apologies to anybody else who does all of those things. It's just those are who I use. Yeah. Um, well, you've had some fantastic comments about your demonstration, Owen. And one of the questions is, do you teach and do you deliver workshops? Um, I would like to. I don't at the moment. Um, it is something I want to do. Uh, I'm finding that as I get older, um, <laughs> it's harder to, to put in a shift uh, and the body doesn't want to. But I'm also, you know, I, I quite enjoy doing demonstrations. Um, I don't know if I'd be as good at teaching um, if, if that's the way. But yeah, I mean, keep your eyes open. Maybe in the next 12, 18 months, there might be something um, available. I might be doing something, um, but I am, I'm quite busy making pots. And as I said before, I'm not a, a fast maker. So therefore my time is taken up making pots um, uh, in general. So yeah, does that answer that one? Yeah, so, yeah. we've had a lot of people saying that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and mean, it would only be very small as well. I mean, I'm not like you know, doing 20 or 30 people. It would be Thanks. one or two people at a time. It would be very much a, you know, one person, two people at the most. Yeah, great. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Watch this space, I suppose. 
yes. <laughs> you, have a, you have a very good, lovely, clear manner. Yes. And you're very good oh. at explaining things. That's okay, the feedback. Cool. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I don't know how it comes across. I'm doing things. I don't know how people see it. So, yeah. That's great. Outstanding, everyone's saying. So it's really good. So thank you very thank much. You so much, Owen. It was, it was amazing to see you in action today. It was really good. Really good for a Friday morning. Absolutely. I can go and have a cup of coffee now. And, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Or something a little bit stronger. <laughs> okay, I mean, maybe the sun is quite low, but it's, I don't think it's quite <laughs> in <my> quarter yet. <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, yeah, just to say, uh, Huge thank you for everyone who's joined us this morning. Yeah, no, thank you all to, to yeah, for watching. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, please stay, please stay. You know, tune. The Digital Craft Festival is happening all weekend, and there is so much to do. Watch support makers in this very tough time. Everyone's uh, web shop is up on the Digital Craft Festival website. It's really important. Um, Fantastic makers, great quality of work. It's yeah, really and. And here is to the Craft Festival next year as well, here in Bobby. So it's definitely going to happen, definitely going to happen. <laughs> um, and, we, and me and Flora are back tomorrow. We are catching up with Katie Warriner, who's a leather maker here in Devon. Uh, she won the Tony Piper Award at the, in the summer. So if you do want to sign up for that, I think you can on the Digital Festival website. Um, and yeah, and last plug to Arwin, Arwin, Arwin Jones Ceramics.co.uk and we're open next Wednesday. Come and say hello. Take care, everyone. Thank Have a fabulous day. Thanks, Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Bye. Take care.